This is John Daly at Ruddy Mead, England. The hour has come and gone this 19th day of June, 1215, the hour when King John agreed to sign the Magna Carta. But the king has still not left Windsor Castle, seven miles away, for the Council Meadows here on the Thames. The patience of the barons gathered here at Runny Mead is at the breaking point. After three days of haggling with the king's emissaries, the 49 articles of the Magna Carta still remain the barons' unconditional terms of peace to end the war which has been raging up and down this English isle for more than a year. If John does not arrive, and that shortly, there is the strongest possibility that the barons will take to the sword once again, march on Windsor Castle, and once more plunge England in civil war. This is the dread thought that strikes fear into the hearts of thousands upon thousands of people who have gathered here from all over England. Runny me, June the 19th, 1215. CBS is there. King John, Runny Mead, the Barons and their Magna Carta. CBS takes you back 732 years to a momentous milestone on the road to modern democracy. All things are as they were then, except for one thing. CBS is there. CBS is there, produced and directed by Robert Louis Cheon, is based on authentic historical fact and quotation. And now... June the 19th, 1215. The meadow called Runny Mead and John Daly. Fantastic nature. It's a clear, beautiful spring day. And for days now, the barons and their forces have been waiting. Every hour, their numbers grow larger and larger. More and more gaily-colored pavilions rise over the meadows to quarter this host. Judging by the tremendous array of men and weapons, we would say that here at Runnymede stands the bulk of the might and power of England. Three hundred barons or more are here with at least two thousand knights in full armor. With their host of retainers, yeomen, and other fighting men, they constitute the greatest striking force ever assembled on English soil. Spears, pikes, battle axes, swords, crossbows, burnished helmets and armor, a gleaming sea of deadly metal in the springtime sun. The leader of the barons, my lord Robert Fitzwalter, is with us now at our CBS microphone. He wears chain, lane, or rather late chain armor under a white surcoat. His choir stands a few short distance away, a few feet from us, holding his helmet, his sword, and his shield. Lord Fitzwalter is a picture of strength and quiet confidence. My lord... Do you think King John means to break his word and not sign the charter? What King John means to do, I know not. He has shown bad faith before. He may show bad faith again. And exactly what will you do, sir, if King John does not appear to sign the charter? I have said it before, and I will say it again. We will march on Windsor Castle and tear it down stone by stone on his stubborn head. But, sir, what of the reports we have heard that even at this present moment, mercenary soldiers drawn from the continent by King John are landing at several points along the English coast? We are aware of that. But, my lord, suppose this meeting here at Runnymede is a ruse, a trap set for you by King John. What if instead of arriving peacefully, his forces come charging onto this field, hoping to take you by surprise? That is a possibility. But if John Soft Sword chooses that manner of talking peace, he will find us quite ready to answer in kind. My lord Fitzwalter, many observers think that King John will never accept Article 49 of the Charter. So we are beyond the point of being concerned with what King John thinks of any particular article in the Charter. We have haggled about it quite enough. It stands as it is. He signs today, and that before the shadows of our swords grow much longer, or mayhap, England will be without a king. And if it came to such a crisis, sir, do you think the people of England would stand in back of you? The people? What mean ye by the people? Why, the common folk, my lord Fitzwalter, the multitude gathered over there along the fringes of the meadow. Oh, yes, the people. I presume they stand behind us, but I fail to see in what manner they are concerned. Does not the Charter talk of the rights of all free men, my lord? Free men, yes, but free men are people. Free men are free men, nobles, knights, lords, not serfs, yeomanry. But if the people do not stand to profit by the Magna Carta, if my you lord... you will forgive me, I have weight your matters on my mind at this moment. Thank you, my lord Fitzwalter. The leader of the barons is walking away now, back to his lieutenants who are gathered before Fitzwalter's pavilion. And while we were speaking, a message was handed to me saying that my colleague, Don Hollenbeck, in a CBS mobile unit, has reached Windsor Castle. Don, is there anything stirring at Windsor? Any sign of the king's imminent departure for Runnymede? Nothing much yet, John. I'm standing outside the south moat of the castle. The drawbridge is still up. There's a considerable force of the king's loyal men here, and it keeps growing all the time. I would say that now there are at least a thousand armed men here at Windsor, 
nobles, knights and their retainers, yeomen, crossbow men, and foot soldiers, I doubt whether in the 49 years that John has lived, or in the 16 years that he has reigned, the sixth and youngest son of Henry II, surnamed Blackland of the House of Plantagenet, has ever faced a more crucial moment. No one can say whether he will return from running mead with his crown on his head, if he returns at all. We're trying to set up an interview with one of the king's men, John, and I'll let you know when we're ready. Right. Here at Runnymede, we're at the south end of the meadow, and we can see the whole of the council field spread out before us. To the north, about six long acres away, is the road from Windsor. To our left, the meadow is flanked by the Thames, and directly in the center of the field, underneath the canopy draped in the royal pennant, is a large council table. It looks like any other ordinary table, but the decisions that may be taken there today may very well affect the whole course of English history. To our right are huge crowds, masses of people who have come from one end of England to the other to witness what may happen today. These are the people, the very people who loom not very large in the mind of the leader of the barons, Lord Fitzwalter. Ken Roberts is among them with a CBS microphone, and it might be interesting to hear what their thoughts are. So over to the people and Ken Roberts. This great crowd of people has been gathering for days from all over England. Some have come on foot, some in donkey carts, some even down the Thames on boats. Many have slept in the open fields, bringing their provisions with them. There are men, women, and children, entire households. Many, weary with the long wait, are resting on the ground, but most of them are standing about singly and in groups, their eyes fastened on the road from Windsor Castle. Here, for example, is one member of this crowd, a man dressed in a light tan tunic made from flaxen cloth. Friends, what part of the island are you from? I... Uh, I'm come from Northumberland. Northumberland, eh? Well, that's quite a distance to travel, isn't it? Aye. Goodly journey. Three days on the way, I was. You must be very interested in the peace conference to have made such a long journey. Aye. I would know what will be. What will happen to your crops while you're away? No crops of I this year. You mean you haven't planted at all? Nay. Not a seed. Well, why not? I will not say. Could it be that your last year's wheat was seized by the king's bailiff? I will not say. Or perhaps the baron steward seized your barley. Nay, it was millet. I will not say. I see. And uh, which side would you like to see win out today, the barons or the king? I will not say. I would have peace. Not a seed will I plant until there be peace. Enough of strife, say I. Enough of barons and kings stealing poor man's crops, say I. That I will not say. I'm come from Northumberland and I would have peace. Of course. And uh, what do you think of the Magna Carta? No read, no write, can I. Nor trust I things on parchment. I will not say. I'm come from Northumberland and I would have peace. Thank you. Thank you. I did not say... And, and here's another man. What is your name, sir? Uh, his name is Peter Harbeck, and I'm his good wife, Cecilia. His good I'm, wife, I'm, Cecilia, yes. And you're both citizens of... Uh, uh, no, Sunday Town is where he's from, and I'm from Dublin. A cloth merchant is what we be. Right. And no finer cloth than Harbeck cloth is sold nor made. Exactly. And what, sir, are your hopes for the outcome of this peace conference today? Well, oh, yes, to be sure. Tell the man, Peter. Yes, tell him about his treasure to... cloth, the barons and kings, yes. clothe them in the finest woolens. And mind you, no finer woolens than Harbeck woolens are sold nor no, made. No, tell him not a coin have you been paid by king nor baron since this war began. I don't the hopes. Ah, the hopes. Ah, sir, we hope and deepen it on their arms and open their purses, right. or there'll be no Harbeck cloth for England anymore. Right, we shall be ruined. Yes, sir. Would you like to see the Magna Carta sign? Well, no, I would truth, we would. It's a good conduct for the barons we hear, we... and it has our blessings. But will mean the end of the war and the, the payment of our debts, we hope. Well, we hope. Well, thank you, Master Hobbock, for a very informative interview. Well, well, thank you, man, Peter, for the sake of the lost And here is another man. He's wearing a long black tunic with slash pockets and draped sleeves. By his garb, I would say he's a scholar. Is that right, sir? Poor, poor scholars. We never can hide our misfortune, can we? Misfortune? Aye. We know all the answers, but who lends us here? Why, then, this is your opportunity. You have the ear of the world. Speak, sir, scholar. Of what? The heavens? The earth? I have a sea of wisdom. Of what shall I speak? Why, speak of King John. Ah, yes. Speak of the devil. John, John. 
A bald pate is soon shaven, and our good king will be well barber today. The barons will see to it. But, alas, there will be other monarchs, may even tyrants, who will contest man's right to determine his own destiny. I, at time, and at times, they may even be victorious in dimming the glow of freedom. But extinguish it, never, never, never. Then you think the Magna Carta means freedom? Freedom. Freedom. A wide word. A broad word. What is freedom? Is it yours or is it mine? Freedom for what? Why, for the people, of course. <laughs> Indeed, sir. <laughs> Sir, thou art a crackbait. Freedom for the barons and only for the barons. The people will still remain under the power of their overlords. The people will still have no will but the will of their masters. But in time, ah, uh, yes, in time the barons may find their power too contested, as they contest the power of their king today. Perhaps they may live to regret that it was they who pointed the way to man's freedom here in England. <laughs> that would be a goodly dress, wouldn't it? to fashion a harness for the king and find themselves checked and bridled in their own strappings with the people snapping the whip. <laughs> our good scholar seems vastly amused by his own wit and wisdom. He's walked away from our microphone laughing to himself. While we were talking, however, a message was handed to me. The cardinal subdeacon, Pandolf, the Pope's emissary to the court of King John, has just arrived at Windsor Castle. So over to Don Hollandbeck. Probably hear the chains as the drawbridge goes over the moat following the admittance of Cardinal Pendle. The Pope's emissary arrived two minutes ago. With him came the seven bishops of England, and what this may signify is anybody's guess. With me now at our CBS microphone is Lord Fitzrogers, a spokesman for the king, a loyal nobleman who's been very close to the king's council for many years. He wears link chain armor. His squire stands by holding his helmet and sword, that long two-handed sword that King John's brother Richard the Lionhearted wielded so famously in the Holy Land Crusades and on the continent. My Lord Fitzrogers, does Cardinal Pandolf's arrival here at Windsor Castle mean that His Holiness has thrown his support behind King John? It would pleasure me greatly, good sir, to answer your question. But in truth, I know no more than you do. I am not privy to the King's counsel. Well, all right, then. Is the King going to sign the Magna Carta? The King has promised to sign but if I may speak frankly, I fear the consequences of that signing. What do you mean, my lord? Most informed observers believe it is for the good of England. Perhaps, but then again, perhaps not, young sir. In the historical development of a folkland, there are times when unity should be cherished more than feudal liberty. The barons have been fighting each other for a long time, storming each other's castles, robbing each other's lands, impoverishing England, weakening her strength. John is ambitious for England, not for himself. He would have England a strong and united power, a power to be feared on the continent. Now, if the Magna Carta is signed, England will have a multitude of rulers instead of one. And as the Holy Book says, every kingdom divided against itself is brought to desolation. For we shall be a prey to every marauding power on the continent. Ah, no, young sir, it is a fine point, you will agree. This Magna Carta of which you speak, may be a good thing for the Baron, but is it a good thing for England? Is it a good thing for England? Thank you, my Lord Fitzrogers. The noble Lord is walking away from our microphone now, his squires following him. He has raised an interesting point which historians may well ponder in the future, but which for now we'll leave to the judgment of our listeners. The trumpets are sounding inside the courtyards across the moat. The drawbridge is coming down. The yeomen, crossbowmen, and foot soldiers are springing to attention. The knights and nobles are being helped onto their horses by their retainers. That trumpet must have been the prearranged signal for King John's appearance. It looks as if this army is going to march. The drawbridge is down. The royal standard bearers are coming across. They're turning left in the direction of the council meadows. And here is John, King of England, astride a big black charger. The king wears a white surcoat over his armor with the red knight templar cross embroidered across the chest. King John, you know, has never ventured on the crusade to the Holy Land. There's Langdon, the Archbishop of Canterbury, riding to the right of the king. King John is flanked on his left by William the Marshal, commander of his forces. And there's Cardinal Pandolf, the Pope's emissary, next in order. And after him, the seven bishops of England. At last, John is off to Runnymede. We're going to move up with the king's forces in our CBS mobile unit, but now... John Daly at Runnymede, you've heard the news. What's the reaction in the Baron's camp? The news that King John is on his way has stirred up a flurry of heightened activity here at the Baron's camp. All about me I can see knights in their heavy armor, being helped under their horses by their retainers. Yes, and the crossbowmen, many of them, 
are fitting their deadly bolts into their powerful weapons. Somehow, every night, every armed yeoman, everyone here seems to be getting ready for trouble. If trouble comes and they're doing it with a will all over this meadow, men are preparing for battle if there is to be a battle. I can see my lord Fitzwalter. He's mounted now and flanked by his close lieutenant. Eustace de Vesey has just handed to Fitzwalter a scroll and no doubt it's the Magna Carta. I'm close enough to the leader of the Baron to see the smile upon his face. It's a sardonic smile with just a hint of triumph. He just did a very curious thing, by the way. With his left hand, he brushed the scroll back and forth across his chin while his right hand fondled the great sword that is hanging by his side. It was an eloquent gesture, not lost upon his lieutenants either. The Magna Carta are the sword, or the sword. That's what it says. But it's going to take some time for King John to cover the seven miles from Windsor to Runnymede. So while he's on his way, let's switch to our headquarters pavilion for Quincy Howe and an analysis of the Magna Carta. I hold a copy of the Magna Carta in my hand. Article 49 states specifically that the barons shall have the right to elect 25 nobles from among themselves to administrate the new laws contained in the other 48 articles of the Charter. This is remarkable. If the law forces the king to share his power, what becomes of the divine right of kings? What's more, this revolutionary document, the Magna Carta, demands security that the laws and freedoms it contains shall be guaranteed and fulfilled. I quote from Article 49. If the king or any of his justiciaries or bailiffs or any of his ministers shall break these articles of peace and security, the aforesaid five and twenty barons shall go to our lord the king and shall petition to have redress without delay. And if the king shall not amend it within a reasonable time, the whole community of the land shall distrain and distress the king by all the means which they can. That is to say, and I'm still quoting from Article 49 of the Magna Carta, by taking his castles, lands, possessions, and in every other manner which they can, until amendment of the wrongs shall be made. End of quote. Now this has no precedent. It's completely unheard of. It means a new philosophy of government for England, with future consequences that no one can foresee. Will King John sign this Magna Carta? Will he peacefully give up the traditional prerogatives of a monarch accountable only to God for his actions? No one yet knows, but we're soon going to find out. And now, back to the Baron's camp on the meadow and John Daly. John Hollenbeck is on his way over here from Windsor with King John, accompanying King John and his troops, and he tells us that the king and his men have halted about one half mile from here. Right, John. The king's forces have stopped at the river bend just about half a mile from Runnymede. That halt was ordered by William the Marshal, the king's commander, so that they could permit the foot soldiers to catch up with the mounted knights. Well, what do you make of this maneuver, Don? Well, look, I'd say the king appears anxious to have his full force compactly behind him when he reaches the meadow. I see. Well, would you say that... The foot soldiers are getting here now, John. They're approaching, but... Well, they're fanning out into the fields on either side of the road. It looks as if... Go ahead. It looks as if what, Don? We're not getting you. Come on in. What's wrong? Why, uh, there's nothing wrong, John. I was merely about to remark that it looks to us as if England this spring is lovelier than it's ever been. And what could be lovelier than England in the spring? Agreed, John? Yes, of course. And I suppose it's censorship, Don. But as my Lord Fitzwalter said, the barons are ready for anything. And if it means that the king intends to charge, the barons will be ready. The crowds of spectators, massed at the east end of the meadow, by the way, know that King John is headed this way... And they've moved back, way back. And they're still pushing and shoving to get back out of the way of any possible action. There's a thick cloud of dust in the distance over the road from Windsor Castle. And I can make out a body of horsemen advancing down the road, coming close to the meadow. It's King John with a packed mass of knights and nobles. They're riding forward at a slow canter. The foot soldiers in the fields on either side of the road are keeping pace with the canter. King John and his retinue have halted now. They've pulled up their horses on the extreme north fringe of this meadow. As if by a signal, the foot soldiers have stopped dead in their tracks. The king and his close party are still making no move to come forward. They're seated upon their horses, just looking in silence at the huge force of barons across the meadow. 
sort of sizing the situation up. And it's strange now how quiet everything is getting. Almost a deadly quiet. I get the funny feeling of looking at a still painting, at a tremendous canvas with John seated upon his horse, the dead center of the picture. Even the great crowd that fringes the meadow is hardly moving at all, and there's hardly a sound from them. Here at the south end of the meadow, the mounted knights and the barons are watching and waiting. There's nothing but a deep, sullen silence, broken occasion. There's the first move! The first move in this fantastic game of chess being played here at Runnymede Meadows. John and his close party have dismounted. They're walking to the council table in the center of the meadows. I'm going to move up to that table as fast as I can. Meanwhile, perhaps Don Hollenbeck can come in without censorship again, since the king is evidently going to talk and not fight. I can this time, John. They did cut us off while the king's forces charged up to the meadows. I, I don't understand the maneuver. Perhaps it was a bluff to frighten the barons, a bluff backed by might, but it certainly did not succeed. Lord Fitzwalter and his lieutenants in the barons' camp have dismounted. They're walking forward now to meet John and his party. Fitzwalter is flanked by Richard. That's the Earl of Clare and Geoffrey, Earl of Essex and Gloucester. King John is at the council table now. The king's in the center. Stephen Langdon, Archbishop of Canterbury, is on his right. William the Marshal, Earl of Pembroke's on his left, and behind them, Cardinal Pandolf and the seven bishops. The barons have reached the council table now, and so has John Daly, I see, so over to him. The barons are waiting for King John to make the first move, and the king's face, as he looks at Lord Robert Fitzwater, is absolutely expressionless. The king has turned to Archbishop Langdon, and that was the king's voice commanding the archbishop to open the conversation. My sons, I greet you. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Ghost, I pray for the peace of this realm and the salvation of our souls. God grant us wisdom and good counsel in the great matters before us. Amen. My Lord Fitzwalter, the king is ready to affix his royal seal to the charter, provided all of you first swear fealty and declare yourself his lead men. Most venerable father, we, the knights and nobles of England, in solemn assembly, swore upon the high altar of St. Edmundbury that we are no longer liegemen of John Plantagenet, and we will hold ourselves so till he should, by this charter, confirm to us and our heirs all that we demand. Fitzwalter has thrown the, the Magna Carta on the table. Seal first. Then our oath of allegiance. Oh, my sons, my sons, I beseech you. Has there not been enough of strife and bloodshed? His royal seal first. The archbishop has turned to the king, appealing to him, both arms outstretched, but the king himself I has moved forward in his speaking. So, my lord, it's water. You and your barons refuse to take an oath of fealty to the crown. Oh, ah, yeah, you know very well that... Ah, the arch... matters not. Of what worth is the oath of traitors? Come, let us be done with this tiresome affair. My lord marshal, give them the document which I have caused to be drawn up. Give it to them and let us be gone. William the Marshal has One thrown the king's document you, on the sire. table. This document of yours, does it contain the nine and forty points of law we petitioned for? Eight and forty. And in truth, if I love not peace, if I held not so dearly the honor and wheel of this realm, never would I have consented to accept even these eight and forty outrageous demands. Sire, these eight and forty laws which you so graciously grant us are quite worthless without surety that they will be administered in good faith. Surety! Surety! You dare ask for surety. Is not the word of your king sufficient surety? Sire, we question not your good faith. Nevertheless, this, this is the document we wish you to seal. This is our Magna Carta. This alone will satisfy us if you wish peace. Your royal seal, sire. Hearken for me, my lords. My noble lords. I, John, by the grace of God, King of England, am only accountable to our Lord in heaven. And to his holy servant in Rome, Innocent III, I am the king. I make the law. You ask that we grant the church freedom from state power. We grant that. You ask that we restrain our bailiffs from seizure of land for debt. Grant it. You ask that no free man be put to death for petty crimes. Grant it. You ask that no constable be empowered to seize goods for relief of the state. Grant it. You ask that freemen be tried by an elected jury. Grant it. These, these are all the divers laws to the number of eight and forty. Grant it. Grant it. Grant it. But when you ask, nay, demand, the administration of these laws be placed in the hands of private ready barons, I say, not grant it. Not grant it. Why don't you ask for my throne? Why don't you ask for my crown? By the saints. I, and no one administer the law in this realm. Never. 
Never will I grant liberties that will make them be a slave. I am the king. I am the law. Your royal... King John king has turned his back upon the barons. He motions to Cardinal Pandulf and the Pope's emissary comes forward, his long red robes trailing the ground, taking a scroll from beneath his red robe. He unrolls it and has begun to read from it. Universis Christi Fidelibus. And Paginam Inspectorus, Salutum et Apostolicam, Benedictionem. Cardinal Pandolf is reading Latin, and I am not a Latinist, but I did catch the word innocentus, which undoubtedly means that it's a letter from Pope Innocent III addressed to the barons. This is something we hadn't anticipated, or we would have had a Latin scholar handy to give you a running trans... Oh, just a moment. Quincy Howe is motioning for the microphone. Go ahead, Quincy. Yes. An official translation of the letter that Cardinal Pandolf is reading, and it's been handed to me, John. It's a message from the Pope addressed to the barons. The message rebukes the barons for their lack of fealty to the crown. It accuses them of persecuting the king. The message refers to the Magna Carta as vile, base, unlawful, unjust, induced by violence and threats. The message goes on to say that His Holiness reprobates and entirely condemns an agreement of this kind. And finally, it threatens both the king and the barons with, with excommunication if the barons compel King John to sign the charter, especially Article 49. Now, John Daly. A threat. A threat of excommunication against John and his barons both if the king signs the Magna Carta. Fitzwater and his men are stunned when they insist upon their demands in the face of dread excommunication. Yes, Fitzwater has turned and has signaled to his forces to advance. They're defying the king. The barons' forces are moving forward. Two thousand armed knights moving up for battle. This position can become very difficult, but as long as the king remains here, we're in no danger. The Archbishop of Canterbury now is pleading with King John to sign. He's pointing to the Magna Carta, waiting for the royal seal. The king's face is contorted with fear and anger. He stands behind the council table, staring, just staring at the oncoming barons moving slowly across the field. His own forces at the north end of the meadow, are waiting for a signal from him, but there's no signal. The oncoming knights are no more than... King John has spoken to William the Marshal. The Marshal is handing him a seal. It's the royal seal. The king holds it up. The king has cried, Behold our seal, and Fitzwater has motioned his forces to halt. Behold our seal! With its own weight, it kills our majesty. For by this act, I uncrown your king. I give you five and twenty silence in my stand. King John has sealed the Magna Carta. All 49 articles are law. Robert Fitzwater is holding the Magna Carta over his head, waving it at his throat. The knights have broken... June the 19th, 1215. King John signs the Magna Carta at Runnymede, and a new age of freedom begins. You have been listening to The Signing of the Magna Carta, another broadcast in the series CBS is There, produced and directed by Robert Louis Sheehan. The Signing of the Magna Carta was written by Henry Walsh and Robert Louis Sheehan. Next week... March 6, 1836, The Defense of the Alamo. CBS is There. This is CBS, the Columbia Broadcasting System.